Um, so you should see the screen right now, uh, what's happening at CSHL today. You see that? Yeah. Awesome. So my plan was to finish the lecture from last week and then uh, start this week's. Um, and just, I, I guess we've already been talking about this and uh, Zainab has muted herself. So I'm going to assume that uh, that she's, she's trying to multitask, but she does that well. So um, if we end up hearing from anyone else, yeah. we'll, we'll include them in this. Um, but I just wanted to make note of a, a couple things. Like um, while we are on this hiatus, um, definitely work on establishing a routine. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, for now, I'm gonna mute some people. You can unmute yourself if you want to participate, uh, but that just makes sure that there's not a lot of background noise, uh, especially for the recording. Um, so things that you should include as you're establishing a routine. Um, I know Mr. Ellen Bogan will give this a massive thumbs up, but uh, doing read, reading for pleasure, um, aside, from, aside from just the reading for classes, uh, you know, it's, it's a great way to relax. It's a great way to, you know, some people consider it meditative, um, it looks like Mr. Ellen Bogan is holding up a book. Uh, go ahead, tell us what, what one that is. This is called A Kirigan. It's, uh, it's about a, an Israeli father and a Palestinian father, both of whom lost children in, in terrorist attacks. And they become, they join a group called Combatants for Peace. And it's based somewhat on a true story. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Focus on, on trying to get some exercise in. Uh, my plan uh, is to make sure that I'm biking every day, at least 30, 45 minutes. Um, that is something that's very, uh, that, that has been a routine for me, but uh, like Ayana was saying, walking the dogs, um, you know, if I, I think that I wanna start just like doing jumping jacks at the beginning of these sessions, just to kind of get people in the habit of, of doing something, something physical. Um, trying to get non-screen time. It can be really tempting to uh, sink your time into watching lots of movies. Um, but, you know, sometimes that, that non-screen time can be just as valuable, um, just away, even away from reading, away from exercising, uh, just spending some time on a board game, on a puzzle, uh, card game, something so that you're interacting with the other people in your house um, in a non-screen way. Um, we're going to have some time on our hands. Um, this is gonna last a while. Uh, if it doesn't, then great, but um, we're looking at possibly months and not just weeks. So looking at starting a new hobby, learning a new skill, uh, those are things that um, can, can last your entire lifetime and uh, this is a unique moment. Um, it, it, it seems really negative, but you can turn that negative into a positive. Um, I think it's really important to reach out to others. And I know that I've been doing that uh, to make sure that uh, folks are feeling uh, connected. Um, hi, Aisha. You're a little early. So, Aisha. So, Aisha, we'll, we'll get physics together at 11.30. All right. Bye. All right, I'll see you then. Um, you never know who might need to hear from you, who might um, appreciate that ear. I know that's something that you do really well, Ayana. Um, and, you know, we, we just need to be cognizant of the people who we're not hearing from. And, you know, sometimes they might be reluctant to talk. Uh, and I know that a lot of folks are feeling particularly stressed out because, um, they don't know what to expect. Um, we, I don't know that any of us have been through something like this before. So um, just understanding that uh, we all can afford to connect with other people, um, even if it's just virtually. Um, uh, it is really important to keep up with your studies. Um, if you are not feeling caught up, well, what a great opportunity you have, right? Um, if you are feeling caught up, then this is a great chance, especially with CS, 
um, to brush up on your programming skills and give yourself um, some some challenges, right? And if you're looking for challenges, I can definitely uh, point you in the way of some good programs that you can work on writing. Um, make a schedule for yourself and stick to it. Um, it's really far too easy to settle into bad routines. Make sure you settle into the good ones. Uh, even if you don't stick to your schedule 100%, um, don't, don't, don't be that person who says, well, I can't do it, so I'm not even gonna start. Um, just try to, try to make that rough schedule for yourself. Here's what I'm gonna do at 8 a.m. Here's what I'm gonna do at 1 p.m. every day. Uh, I'm gonna make sure I'm eating lunch um, and FaceTime you know, my one friend who really needs um, that, uh, who, who really needs that check-in time. Um, and that's, that's how you know, you're just gonna, you're gonna keep up those healthy habits for yourself. Um, any, any questions? Say now, Ayana. You can unmute yourself if you want to participate. Oh. Zainab is making noise on chat. All right. So um, let's hop on the Nearpod. Might help if I shared the screen. All right, so go ahead. Lairc, L-A-E-R-C is our code. How's it going, San Antonio? We're going to start, San Antonio, we're going to start physics in um, about half an hour, so at 1130. All right, is everyone on the Nearpod? Good, good. All right, Santonio, we're gonna be on physics at about 11.30. Okay, so if you remember in the way back machine to last week, um, that we were talking about uh, binary trees and we were talking about um, finding the the max sum of, of a tree and that it and that it was a recursive function. Um, Santonio and DJ, uh, we will hit physics at 1130. So um, finding this max sum is a recursive function. Um, we're gonna see how that works in just a second, but essentially what we do is we find the, um, the left side and then find the right side. So we're gonna start at what's called the root node and we're gonna find the sum of the left, compare it to the sum on the right and take the higher sum. That's the general idea. So here's what that looks like in pseudocode. Uh, this function is called find max sum, and obviously the function name is really important because what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up using that find max sum down here. Um, the node we're representing with a variable n. So here's the node n. Uh, we're starting at the root node. Um, if n is null, meaning that there's no node there, then it just returns zero. For example, um, if we're at this node three, 
Um, how many children nodes does it have? You can unmute, unmute yourself to participate. This node three, how many children nodes does it have? Zero. Exactly. So if we try to find the left node, it's going to return null, which will be zero because it won't help us finding the maximum sum. Um, but if we look at the children nodes of two, how many children nodes are there on two? Two. Two. Excellent. So we've got four and five as children nodes. So that means that um, when it hits two, four, and five, n is not equal to null, and it'll go down here. And what this is doing is it's finding the max sum of the left nodes, finding the max sum of the right nodes, and then comparing the two. So if the max sum of the left nodes is greater than the right, then what it's saying is whatever the sum is so far, add the left nodes, the sum of the left nodes to that total sum so far. If not, take the right. So let's go through and see what that looks like. Um, so if we start at the root node one, it's saying find the sum of the left nodes and compare it to the sum of the right nodes. Um, let's just go to the right nodes right now. The right node is three. And what is the sum of the left nodes for three? Zero. Zero. What's the sum of the right nodes for three? Zero. Zero. So for three, it's just going to add zero to three. And that will be the sum of the right nodes for node one. So the sum of the right nodes is three. And now we'll use some recursive functions to find the sum of the left nodes. So it'll go to node two. And what is the sum of the left nodes for node two? Four. Four. And what is the sum of the right nodes for node two? Five, which one is bigger? Node two. Which one, is, uh, which one of the left node and the right node, four or five, is bigger? Five. Yep. And so it'll add that right node, which is five, to two. And so that'll be seven. Right. And node one will look at the left nodes, which is a sum of seven and the right nodes, which is a sum of three, and we'll say seven is greater than three, and it will add um, seven to one, which is this node, for a, for a sum of what? About oh, eight. Yep, eight is the result. So that's a way of using recursion in order to find uh, what's called a maximum sum or a maximum path. Um, I'm going to let him go on for a couple minutes. Uh, he makes some really great points about Python, um, but I'm going to pause it a couple times. I don't know what's going to happen if I hit all devices. I think that will play well for you guys, but I am not sure. So does that mean you get to play it on your own? Um, let's see. The video? Yeah. Hi, I'm Joe James. Okay. I hear you playing it on your own. I am Joe James. All right. So maybe that was a bad choice. I'll let you guys watch it. You got it, Ayana? Yeah, I got the video. Okay. Zainab, you all set? What part do you want us to watch it to? Um, watch it till you get here.
Okay. I can barely hear you, Zainab. Can you lock up to 119? I think she said, do we watch it until 119? Uh, until about 2.20. Oh. I like 119. There's two functions he goes into. Are you guys there? All right, so let's talk about two of the functions that, that he goes over. Um, notice that he has, th this is object oriented, right? And, and we've seen this before where there are classes and there are functions within the object and there's this um, self variable. Self variable. Uh, what he has done here, I'm gonna mute you for a second, Ayana. Um, what he has done here is that he has collapsed all of those functions so that we're only seeing the code within the get height function. Um, that's why this looks a little bit different than Replit does. Um, but the idea being that there's lots of different functions on this tree, one of them being get height. And uh, let me get my pointer back here. So if we're at the root, then for the tree, then get height will actually get the height off of that root node. If we're not on the root, then we can't get the height of the tree because you, you, you can't know what the height is of the tree unless you're at the root node. Um, and so then he says, okay, so, so this is a function off of the node, off of that root node. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that 
node function looks like. He, he named both of them get height, which makes sense, but it can be a little confusing. So now we're on the node, we're on the node object itself, which is like the one or the two or the five, whatever. And what we're saying is if both left child and right child exist, well, return one plus the maximum of the height of the left child and the maximum of the height of the right child. Basically, it's get that height of that left child, do this whole thing over again, and figure out how much deeper this tree goes. If only the left child exists, then just get the height of the left child. If only the right child exists, get the height of the right child. And if we're at the end of a branch of the tree, then just return one, which is the height of the node itself. Um, and so if you spend a little bit of time with this particular function, then hopefully it'll make sense, especially if you have a tree in front of you, like the examples that I've been giving you. Um, and it's less important that you're able to produce this code. I'm not, I'm not gonna ask you to produce this kind of code. I am going to ask you to be able to trace it in order to understand um, how that works. And yes, Ayana, uh, Replit does something similar. Um, I don't remember if it's got the minuses and pluses, but you can collapse those functions. Okay, so like I was just saying, the important part for the EA in, in, in computer science is that you're able to trace a recursive algorithm. Um, you should be able to state the output of the recursive algorithm, especially Hi, Dahlia, we're gonna get started with physics at 11.30. I don't know why I'm yelling. Like, doesn't actually make any difference. All right, um, so, the, so the output of the recursive algorithm, especially as it uh, comes to binary trees, is something that you're gonna to wanna to practice. Um, we will get some practice with that. Okay, um, but that's it for this lecture. I wanna get started on uh, the current week's lecture. And if we don't finish with, with that, which we probably won't, then we'll continue tomorrow. Um, but as I said, everything is recorded. So I'm about to exit this one. So when you get kicked, don't worry. Oh, that was fun. Shum, 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 shum. All right, so go ahead and open IHPVW. Is everyone on? Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Zainab. Okay, so um, abstract data structures. We've got a lot of abstract data structures. A um, binary tree is one abstract data structure, and so is a two-dimensional array. We've worked with two-dimensional arrays before, so you have an idea um, about how they work. Um, we're also gonna be talking about things called stacks, um, which is something that operates in uh, last in, first out. Uh, queues, which operate as first in, first out. Linked lists, as I said, binary trees, and we've already talked a little bit about recursion, but we'll talk about how recursion can be used on all of these different data structures. So when we say the words data structures, we're talking about how we hold, bye Michelle Mogan, we're talking about how we hold um, data within the computer, within RAM, and, um, and that way we can access it quickly. Uh, we can make data structures that are able to 
um, are able to give us access to the data, not only efficiently, um, but in ways that are meaningful for the programmer so that we can make more efficient programs. Um, so we know what arrays look like, what lists look like. We know that they have um, a length. Um, we know that if we access the zeroth element, that gets us to the first element. We know that if we access the last element, um, that is the length minus one. We know that if we try to go beyond that length, that it, it just doesn't work. Um, now, in Java and a lot of other languages, if you try to access the negative one element, it won't work. But in Python, and unmute yourself to participate, what happens if you access the negative one element? You'll get the last one in the list. Exactly, you get the last one in the list. So Python does allow us to actually use negative indexes. Um, but you definitely can't use anything other than an integer. That just doesn't even make sense. What's the three and a half element? I have no idea. So here are um, 2D arrays. And this is a way of thinking about 2D arrays where you have um, the, the, first, the first subscript, the first um, index is referring to the row. And then the second index is referring to the column. And so you can visualize this. This isn't how it exists in the computer, but you can visualize it in this way. And sometimes this can be um, really helpful uh, for a visual analysis. So you can determine where things are in your two-dimensional array. Um, this is another way of looking at a two-dimensional array. This is a pseudocode way of looking at it, um, where we're looking at the element at 0, 0. We're looking at the element at 2, 3, right here. And then we're looking at the element at 4, 4. Um, yet another way of visualizing, where we first get the row, the index of the row, in this case, index 0, gives us these columns. And then index one gives us these columns. Um, so now that we, we've seen two-dimensional arrays, you've used two-dimensional arrays for things like not a deal, um, then what are some algorithms that we can implement in order to use them? Um, before we get into that, you can think of a two-dimensional array in another way. Um, and that is that it is an array that holds a list of lists, right? So it's kind of a reference to a bunch of different lists. Um, those exist in a very abstract way somewhere in RAM. Um, but what we can do is uh, we can reference them in a way that makes more logical sense to the programmer. So here's a list of lists. We're calling this array of numbers. It has six rows, one, two, three, four, five, six. And five columns, one, two, three, four, five. Um, we can get that number of rows by doing a length. Um, and we can get the number of columns by doing the length on any one of the rows. Now, in Python, you do not have to have this be symmetrical. In other words, you could have this first row have three elements, the second row could have five elements, the third row could have 20 elements. Um, but for the purposes of a two-dimensional array, as we're talking about them, um, we are focusing on uh, symmetrical two-dimensional arrays, meaning that every row is going to have the same number of columns. Hey, I'm glad, Ayana. Um, and so then we can have, uh, in order to actually print out anything within a, a list of lists, our two-dimensional array, you want to go through all the rows. And then within each row, you want to go through each column. And so this is a simple implementation of how to actually go through and print out um, every column or every cell within a two-dimensional array. Um, I am not concerned about spending a lot of time on these algorithms. Um, you definitely should take a look at them because they are algorithms that come up again and again on the EA. Um, but the first one is averaging, and this would be averaging from a list. So um, in pseudocode, you would have a loop just like um, in, in Python. 
this loop is going from zero to 999. So this is a 1000 element array. And what it's doing is it's keeping a count. Um, and then it's adding um, a particular element called stock to that count, or to the, to the total rather. Um, it's keeping a count because it's making sure that there's something in that stock. So if the stock is zero, it's not going to count it. So let's say 500 elements have a stock that's greater than zero. It'll take that total, divide it by 500, and come up with an average. Um, and the, the general idea being that this is, this is an averaging algorithm that you can remember, uh, you can use over and over again. Uh, on the EA, they're likely to ask you something that involves averaging. Uh, this is an algorithm that converts a list to an array. Um, because remember, in pseudocode, lists and arrays are slightly different things. Um, I'll let you go ahead and, um, at some later point, dig into that. Um, I'm not concerned about talking about the details right now, because that's pretty heavy into pseudocode, and we'll be talking more about that next year. Um, this is a really fascinating algorithm. This is a way of determining all of the factors of a particular number. Hey, it's Victor. Hey, Victor, we'll be um, starting physics in about 10 minutes. Right now, I'm working with the um, computer science students. Um, so this algorithm, it takes a number. So in this case, it's starting with 140. Um, it's keeping a temporary count of what factor we're looking at, in this case, one and then counting up the number of factors in this counter here um, that's currently set to zero. Um, I like this because it's figuring out what the maximum is for the, for the loop. So it's taking the square of the current number and seeing if it's greater than num, meaning that uh, this is the same kind of algorithm that you'd use to find all the factors of a number. Uh, you don't have to proceed after you get the square root um, because you will have found all of the factors after that point. And that's a mathematical definition of how to find the factors. So you see that this first step is checking to see if num, which is the number that we're looking at, mod the current factor we're looking at that's going to go up from one to two to three to four to five and up and up until we get to the square root if that mod equals zero meaning it's evenly divisible then go ahead figure out what the other number is and we can do a div to find out what the other number is for example if we get to um, f equals two then what is going to be num div f 140 div 2. What's that going to be? Unmute to participate. 140 div 2. Say that again. 140 div 2. I'm going to assume you said 70. Good job. Um, hi, Layla. We'll be getting started in, uh, with physics in about 10 minutes. Um, and so this, this letter D, this variable, is going to equal that 70, all right? Um, and so that means that we will have discovered two factors, uh, 70 and 2. Um, hello. I'm going to mute you. And so what that means is that um, f is not equal to 1. f is not equal to d because it's not the square root. In fact, it drops down here, and it says the number of factors equals factors plus 2. So that we just found two factors. And this will continue, right, because we're adding 1 to f. And this will continue as long as we haven't hit the square root. Uh, so this is a pretty cool algorithm. Um, it's not using recursion. It's just using loops. 
Um, and it is a way of determining all the factors of a number. Um, it doesn't really fit into anything else, so that's why we're talking about it now. All right, so let's talk about stacks real quick, and then we will, after we talk about stacks, we'll, we'll continue our discussion tomorrow. So, does anyone know what a stack is? You know what a stack is. I wouldn't ask that question if I didn't think you knew the answer. What's a stack? Something that goes on top of another thing. Yep. So, this is a stack of papers. In fact, it's a stack of bills. Boo, right? Um, right. So, in other words, if we put things on the stack, so this is the bottom one. Oh, I don't need to lose that. I'll get that back later. All right, so this is the bottom one. We're going to put one on top. All right, so now we have a stack of two. We're going to put one more on top. Now we have a stack of three. One more, we have a stack of four. And now we have a stack of five. When I remove items from this stack, am I going to remove the first item of the stack, or, or am I going to remove the last item of the stack? The first item, right? Oh no, the last one. To be the it's going to be the last one. Stacks work on the principle. Oh yeah, that makes sense because stacks work on the principle. There's two ways to phrase this. It's first in, last out, or last in, first out. Okay, both are the same thing, but this was the last one in, and so it'll be the first one out. And then I will undo the stack by taking them off until I get to the first one, which is going to be the last one out. And so those are called phylo or lifo, last in, first out, or first in, last out. Um, let me get back to the Nearpod. I haven't said technical difficulties yet. And I, um, wasn't that on the, wasn't that a get, wasn't that part of the drinking game or something? Yeah. All right. So I said it. It has been said, but I didn't mean it because I haven't actually had them yet. Okay. So um, now you see what I just demonstrated is that we are pushing. We're doing something called push to get things on the stack. And then we're doing something called pop to get things off the stack. Different languages implement this in different ways. How do you push in Python? Uh, append. Append, good. Um, but you can just pop in Python. Pop works in Python. Um, and so that's how we do stacks. Like I said, go ahead, Ayana. I said, so you're saying that pop works, as, works the same as append. Pop works in conjunction with append on stacks. So pop will pop the last item off the stack. Um, append will put things onto the stack. Okay. And this is what I was saying with LIFO. Uh, last in, first out is a way of thinking about how a stack works. Um, there's also a method called isEmpty. Uh, in Python, what we would do is we would simply check the length of the list and that would tell us if it's empty or not. Um, as long as it's not empty, then we can continue popping. We can't pop if it's empty, though. Uh, and this is the pseudocode. So in pseudocode, you will use push and not append. Um, and is empty is the same thing as a collection. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, this is an algorithm to move from an array to a stack. Uh, it's pretty straightforward where we're going from zero to the length of the list, and we're just pushing for every element and that adds it to the stack. Um, printing out a stack, we would do a loop while the stack is not empty and simply pop every element off the stack. Now that's going to show the elements of the stack 
in the reverse order. Remember, it's last in, first out. Um, and so you wouldn't want to use this for um, implementing an algorithm where people get in line, for example. People will be very unhappy if the last person in line gets dealt with first. Um, the, this is, I think it's just repeating. I'm sorry I'm going through this very quickly, but it's just saying the same thing over again. All right. Um, I said we were going to get through stacks. We'll save queues for later. A queue is much more like a line uh, in that it is last in, last out, or first in, first out. Uh, it works much more uh, intuitively. But 